you very much, uh, Mr. Schoner. And uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I am honored to be here. Uh, the title of my presentation today is Living in the Shadows of Katyn. What it in essence means is Katyn historically has ended around middle of May 1940 when the people were murdered. But that's not the end of the Katyn tragedy. We, uh, this is about what it means, how it affected my family, my children, my extended family, Polish people at large, and the Polish nation. I am going to concentrate specifically on what happened with me and my family, simply because this is not enough time to extend it further to people, other Polish people, even though I've met thousands of them, hundreds who lived the life, and this is a second Katyn tragedy, and I call this living history. What I'm going to talk, talk to you about today is present the living history with a human face. And I have prepared the PowerPoint to exemplify exactly what I have said. Uh, we are going to move very fast because this will be over a 70 year span since I was a little boy and I was deported to Siberia. Obviously, in 20, 25 minutes, I can only highlight the key things, historical events, not because I want to talk about history, but because it affected our family and all the Polish people uh, with the Katyn tragedy. And I will only ask you before I begin for one favor. Well, since I'm going to move very fast, there are captions there for a reason, but not intended for this audience because I'm going to narrate. So if you simply would not pay attention to the captions so that you can stay with me, and I promise it'd be the best for you and for me. Thank you very much. Part one. With brevity, I would like to introduce you to my family because they are the ones, my father was murdered. Uh, this is parents' wedding in 1921. My father on the left, captain of the Polish army, who fought in the war against the Bolsheviks uh, in, under Warsaw in 1920. And uh, uh, one of the key reasons why they murdered the Polish officers, not because the soldiers hate to lose the battle, they all do but because communism was stopped from expanding to Europe. And Stalin and the Bolsheviks, meaning the Bolshevik communists, hated the Polish army officers. This was one of two key reasons why they murdered them. And the second was to decapitate Polish nation from the intelligentsia so they can take, o take over later. Uh, my brother and sister on the left, uh, they are uh, older than I, they're deceased now, by six and ten years, and this is the only photo on the right that has survived the war. And the reason was, my mother uh, sent it to my father's sister in Chicago, who came here in 1912, and she preserved it. <coughs> Excuse me. The little boy in the white uniform is speaking to you now. <laughs> My family in Sarny, Poland, where I spent most of my life. And I have divided it briefly so that time is short, so you will know exactly what part, time-wise, we are referring to. Part two, W2 begins, September uh, 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 1939. The only reason why I gave the map, and I have designed it, of the Rubentrop-Molotov uh, uh, Act, everybody here knows what it is, historically, that it was a non-aggression thing, but every time I speak beginning with middle school to university level, I show this map, and the higher the audience is age-wise, I spend 10, 15 minutes talking about it. Why? I don't care about the the non-aggression pact. What they did is sign a secret protocol that unless someone understands that it happened and what it meant, there is no way to understand the Katyn massacre. Why? 
because most Americans that I speak to, and I do research on it, never heard of Katyn. Maybe today they did in the last number of years. But even those that are 60, 70 years old, and what they also don't know, there was a secret protocol where the Germans, not only did they divide Poland in two, but they agreed with one another to finish off the Polish people. Poland was not to exist as a country, never. I would not be speaking here today at all because I was uh, shortly after in Siberia and uh, uh, had the uh, Germans not attacked the Soviets later, Poland would be finished. Those of you who are of Polish origin or Polish, the odds are they would not be here today, 99%. So this is crucial that to know that the Soviets and the Germans were bosom buddies for two years at the beginning of the war. When I pose a question, not to kids, but adults, who were the adversaries at the beginning of the war, they say, the Allies versus Germany. Honest? I say absolutely not. Because the Allies implies not only the Western Allies, but who? The Soviets. But the Soviets for the first two years of the war were bosom buddies, kissing buddies, poetically saying, and they've murdered the Polish officers. So unless you know that this was an uh, uh, agreement, you cannot understand why an ally would kill officers of another ally. I took too much time on this subject. Apologize. No, you didn't. <laughs> well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I just found out that one way to get an applause is to apologize to the audience. <laughs> Okay, uh, this is a quick map. When I was deported from Poland, Soviet Union, Escape 42, Persia, went through 12 countries and four continents. Uh, England is on the left, was there for two years. It came to the United States at age 16, speaking less than 30 words of English language in 1949. The subject is Katyn. My brother, uh, after the Germans attacked the Soviet Union, uh, 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 the Soviets were begging the West, of course, and you, all of you know that, to sign and help the West because they were beaten. And the, America, the West has agreed, and the agreement called for organization of the Polish army. That's not the subject. The subject is my mother for two years plus and my brother looked for our father who was imprisoned by the Soviets. We knew that because he and other Polish officers wrote letters to home, and the Soviets permitted this, not because they were so good-hearted to let the wives know where their husbands are. It was a double-edged sword. They did it to find out where the families were living so they can pick them up and deport them. So for, for two years, the answer was typical with NKVD. We don't know, they probably escaped. <clears throat> Let me tell you something. Escape from the Soviet Union to know and understand communism, in difference to all experts, unless you've lived there, it's hard to understand that mentality. They would rather kill you than let you escape. In this country, you buy a ticket, your next door neighbor doesn't know you left for Paris, not in the Soviet Union. Every rat hole in the Soviet Union was guarded by NKVD and millions of informers. Nobody knew what happened to 15,000 officers. They evaporated into heaven. <clears throat> so we developed, began to worry about what might have happened. Since Polish people know the Russians for years, they know what probably happened. My mother knew that, but you can't on an emotional level admit it. <clears throat> we escaped in 42. <clears throat> mother dies from starvation, <clears throat> uh, disease, uh, a worry, and uh, uh, my brother joined the Polish army, was in Iraq and Italy, and my sister also was sick and uh, became my adoptive mother. And from this point on, the rest of our lives was dedicated to the search, and uh, myself in particular, 
as to what happened to the father. I lived for 20 years with the hope, even we'll come to that in a minute. In 43, the Germans, of course, discovered the Katyn Forest. But only the 4,000 out of 15, we didn't know what happened to 11. For 20 years, <clears throat> I have lived with hope that father is alive. A miracle has happened. <clears throat> My father's sister who came to America in 1912, who preserved that photo I showed you before, her daughter was a surgical nurse in the American army. By coincidence, came to what we called Persia at the time I ran, and found us months after we escaped from the Soviet Union. So we were first cousins, but never met each other before. We thought, in spite of the war, that she may whisk us out of Persia to America. And of course, I'm coming to it. We lived, uh, let me uh, go back a little bit. My aunt in Chicago spent four years looking for her <coughs> brother and his children. A consulate in Chicago, consulate in Mexico, uh, a Polish government in London, Red Cross in London, Red Cross in Tehran, and wrote to Kremlin. And uh, I only showed one document response from London that uh, the children, we don't know what happened with the father, uh, probably murdered in Katyn, we're talking about the 11,000, and the children left for Mexico, but I got sick with scarlet fever day before, and my course has changed for a lifetime. But this shows how the relatives of the Katyn victims suffered not knowing uh, what happened to the officers. <clears throat> Real quick, the Aza that probably, even though this is a highly respected uh, institution, the Aza that probably no one has ever seen this photograph. Out of curiosity, if you did, can you raise your hand? I would like to talk to you later. This happens to be United States 113th Army Hospital, uh, about 100 miles from Persian Gulf, where thousands wounded Americans came from North African campaign, Italy and so forth, either go back to fight or ship to America. A uh, uh, camel stable on the left where I have lived with my sister for over a year, and uh, the right is the cousin, the surgical nurse. What happened, she asked us to visit the hospital about twice a month, and we did and uh, uh, soldiers were asking us, <clears throat> what are the <clears throat> two Polish orphans doing in the middle of a Persian desert? When we told them, they couldn't believe what happened, meaning the deportation of Polish people. Uh, there was a wounded uh, American major so severely that he was going to be shipped to America. Uh, and he asked my cousin to talk me into being adopted and go to America. <clears throat> and I'm 11, 44, I'm 11 years old at the time. After starving to death in the Soviet Union, putting up with the blizzards, uh, uh, NKVD investigations of a kid that's eight and nine, and then living in a camel stable with uh, scorpions and snakes and bats on top of the thing and vultures. Can you just imagine this scenario? It's like watching an Alfred Hitchcock movie. <laughs> and now an American major wants to adopt me and take me to America. But he didn't want to adopt my sister. At the time, I didn't know why, but later on I realized she's about 18 now, uh, gained a few pounds after Siberia, and it was a pretty good girl. So obviously, uh, I said, uh, it'd be really something if he knock on the door at home and say to his wife, honey, I have two adopted children. 
One is an 18-year-old good-looking girl. I don't think it would fly too well, but that's my conjecture. <clears throat> and I decline. Well, there, this was the first moral, major moral dilemma that I had to undertake at age 11. What kid wouldn't go to America if he didn't go through what I did? <clears throat> uh, we we'll skip a few years, <clears throat> uh, war is over. <clears throat> my brother and my future brother-in-law <clears throat> fought in Italy and the Monte Cassino, we all know. <clears throat> The Polish flag was the first flying at the monastery, <clears throat> and the war is over. <clears throat> now this is where the real tragedy of Polish people comes in. <clears throat> the war was over. Everybody went home. The Australians, the Americans, the, the Gurkhas, India, but the Polish people couldn't go back to their country. Not only the army who fought and died. And do you know why? <clears throat> because <clears throat> This was, and I'll talk about it in a minute, an overt conspiracy of silence with this Stalin that things would not come out. But in the meantime, uh, uh, these people, and I've met them to the rest of their life, how it hurts to fight for the freedom of your country knowing that half of it was given away by your own ally who came to Europe to fight for freedom of Europeans. 400,000 Americans died, were killed meaning, 600,000 wounded, they fought for Europeans' freedom and my freedom and their freedom. But it was denied them. So now they found themselves to be people without a home and country. And me being, and I being a kid, the most important thing for any child, any place, is what? Your home, your country your mother and father, and you, when you lose it all, how do you suppose you're supposed to feel? No matter how fair and honest you are, I adore America. I've been an officer in the U.S. Army. But what I'm doing now, I have devoted my retirement to the dissemination of information on uh, deportation and Katyn. Why? Because in America, the beauty of the country is that we can speak the truth, and they don't send anybody to Siberia. <laughs> Did you ever think about that? <clears throat> uh, investigating uh, a cutting. The good people in the United States Congress, 51, 52, all of you are familiar with it, <clears throat> but I just brought it up <clears throat> to show <clears throat> that <clears throat> During this investigation, they found out the key thing was who murdered the Polish officers and were any Western countries involved in the cover-up? <clears throat> I am not going to talk about the details. <clears throat> uh, I have a, a booklet, just in case someone would like to see a booklet on the congressional investigation. It was really determined <clears throat> politely in diplomatic terms because no one wants to accuse the President of the United States and people involved what they knew and what they didn't know. All I can tell you is, and you can quote me on that, the Americans knew immediately after the, the Katyn Forest Massacre was discovered April 13, 1943, shortly after Americans knew uh, that that the Soviets committed this. But I'm not going to expound on this subject, but it was pointed in the booklet that clearly that the Soviets did it, the West knew it, and I am sure, and they kept it, and the Soviets, of course, accused the Germans, which was the easy course, because they didn't, they, as they were saying, that we are trying to ruin the good name of communism, excuse me? There was never such a thing as good name of communism other than the communists thinking that. So in any event, the reasons why the cover-ups began was simple. I'll just mention. There were, three, there were reasons. One was at the time the military expediency, and I understand that. But we in America don't only talk about the reasons why a man murdered somebody, but the law says it's against the law. So what I'm trying to say in brief, we kept quiet to keep the Soviets fighting, 
but later, and I'll say a few words on it, came the Nuremberg war crimes trial that changed the picture. The war is over. We didn't need the Soviets to fight the Germans anymore. <clears throat> Part two in memoriam. <clears throat> Anything I'm going to mention now <clears throat> was <clears throat> dedicated <clears throat> to the search <clears throat> for my father <clears throat> and, and eventually <clears throat> Uh, dissemination of information, as I mentioned a minute ago, on this subject, so that more Americans would know. <clears throat> I have high respect for the office of the presidency, but as I mentioned also at the beginning, if we do not teach our children what really happened, then we are not doing justice to our children. If our politicians knew more history, the odds are they wouldn't make all the mistake. In 98, I was invited by Polish government to go for the pilgrimage to Kharkov, and my father was murdered, and I was met by Polish <coughs> television. And uh, the last question they, they asked me, since I looked for the, my father's grave for 50 years, would I ever come back again? Who wouldn't? In Poland, on uh, 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 Holy Saints Day, uh, uh, All, Saints Day. All, Saints Day. All Saints Day. In Poland, I, pop, uh, I was looking for a Polish expression. Every cemetery is lit up <coughs> with candles. People go to venerate and give honor to their predecessors. Not, it's not the only country. And I ask you, <coughs> my grandpa, first of all, died in Czechoslovakia. My grandma died during the Second War in Poland. My father murdered in Katyn. My mother died in Tehran. And the cousin I showed you in California. There was no jet that could take me one day to all those places, could it? So, I'll ask you a rhetorical question. How am I supposed to feel about what happened in the human race? Should I be a person to get drunk and be in jail and sleep under the bridge or do something else? So, the last sentence that I mentioned to those people, would I ever come back? And my answer was, guess what? Never would I come back to this inhuman land. And I'm glad I said it, <clears throat> because remember Teresa mentioned Dr. Gruner, who was at the exhumation. She and I are also friends. <clears throat> Two, three months before the flight to Smolensk, she asked me, would I have some interest in going on that, on that plane? And the first thing that came to my mind, what I told those people, never again. Lucky for me. Picture of uh, Piatihatki Cemetery, it's outside Kharkov, 15, 20 minutes by, <coughs> uh, by, a, uh, by bus. <coughs> uh, the uh, bell was uh, uh, made by Polish government, shipped to three places <coughs> uh, where the Polish officers were mur uh, murdered, partly submerged under the ground. It was a symbolic gesture that we are with them. And Teresa's uh, Polish uh, title of the book, I don't remember the you mentioned. The title was Kiedy Jesteście Mi Boli, means when, when we are uh, here with you, it's not as bad. I, I didn't make it a pretty good impression. It doesn't hurt, hurt that much. It doesn't hurt that much. Sorry about a quick translation. I can do better, I promise you. <laughs> <clears throat> On the left <clears throat> is, uh, is myself at a, a one of the graves uh, uh, close to the altar with the Polish uh, honor guard and Ukrainian on the left. And the reason is real quick, 2,000 plus Soviet citizens were murdered in the same cemetery. So they were arguing for five years, how are we going? This was the first time that they had an official mass and pilgrimage to, to Kharkov. My American son, we were the only perp 
Uh, by that time, I think he's about 52 that came from America, <coughs> and he's standing by a grave that has 2,025 Polish officers murdered there. <coughs> How did we know that? I'll show you in a second. <coughs> On the upper left, <coughs> When the Polish uh, exhumation team with Dr. Gru Dr. Grune that Teresa mentioned uh, was there in 95-96, when I was going from Krakow on this government train, she was the first person I met, and we began to talk. <coughs> that what they discovered is that uh, uh, every time they murdered people in the Soviet Union, what did they do? They planted trees over there. Because in their mentality, they thought, who would ever come to the Soviet Union and discover with a forest growing in here? Nobody, they thought. <coughs> so what happened, <coughs> they planted the trees, the town expanded, and uh, <coughs> a it was a park, children were playing. So children now come to the parents and say, this is about in the 70s, that there is hands and feet sticking out from the ground. <coughs> they told NKVD, they came with grinding equipment and ground out the graves. <coughs> and now I will pose another rhetorical question, and I won't even use uh, expression you, because I don't want anybody to even momentarily feel bad about what I'm going to ask. <coughs> Hypothetically, 50 years you're looking for your murdered father, you finally find it, to find out that these barbarians from the East, Genghis Khan probably didn't do it like, like this, would ground out the bones of human beings to further cover up the massacre, they put, <coughs> oh, let me, not, let me ask a different question. Would anybody volunteer? And I mean, if you want to raise your hand, what are those two circles on the lower right? Can I, of thousands of people I have spoken to, I'll give you a clue. Nobody guess. <coughs> when they were grounding the bones, <coughs> they knew how deep they were. I have a document from Polish government with a paper. <coughs> what date my father was taken from the camp? what grave he was laid, what layer, all the details. <coughs> they knew, so when the grinding machine came to the end, it compacted the ground, and then when they put more dirt, 25 years later, it was still a real photograph. <coughs> and they put the bones back and uh, planted more trees. <coughs> and one of them, could be my father. Artifacts from the grave. <coughs> and <coughs> here I'm going to <coughs> offer, uh, in spite of the fact, <coughs> I'm trying not to talk about anything historical that is knowledge to uh, people uh, in a law school and history professors, but maybe you never came across this, and most people never heard of it. <coughs> When we exhumed those uh, corpses, what they found, that the Polish officers were uh, buried in full uniform uh, and boots and a, a lot of documentation, all this came from the grave. But when they by accident came to where the Soviet citizens were uh, uh, murdered, they were naked. <coughs> Since time is running, and this is a serious audience, I always ask someone from the audience, can you guess why? Well, I'm not going to, time is running. I'll tell you why. <coughs> because in the Soviet Union, when they shot those people, they were so poor that they stripped all the clothing from the Soviet citizens to give it to the next guy. But the question is, why didn't they do it with Polish officers? Leather boots up to the beautiful, they were known all over you. Why would they bury them in uniforms? Again, I'm not asking anybody to raise your hand, I'll just tell you. Because they wanted to hide the least 
bed of evidence because if the Soviet citizens are walking around with the Polish officers boots and maybe jackets the cat would be out of the pan. <coughs> I wanted to take <coughs> and I did a sample of soil <coughs> from the graves leaves and a few branches to take <coughs> home <coughs> uh, to America with me and to give a portion to my father's sister, who at the time was 102 years old, bo born in 1897, was in an uh, old age home. <clears throat> to the left was a mass with five different denominations, uh, uh, Protestants, uh, 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 Catholics, Christians, Jewish, and a few others. On the lower right is Polish President uh, Kwasniewski, <clears throat> and Ukraine President Ronin Kuchma, Kuchma, Kuchma. <clears throat> and the song, representation from US, Russia, and England, or British, was not there. And do you know, would you like me to tell you why? Because it was too expensive to fly there. All the seats on the airplanes were taken. That's the reason why they couldn't come. Sorry for joking. <clears throat> they didn't come because all the papers in the U.S. would jump. What is American government sending representation to Kharkov? To because this would evoke conversation. Why are they going there? <clears throat> and they wanted to keep it a secret to the extent possible. Soviets had the biggest secret of all time about Katyn, but we did a pretty good job, and let me, don't let anybody misunderstand me. We're talking about specifically the people in the White House, State Department, W uh, War, um, Office of War Information, and guess who? G2, which is Army Intelligence. And this is not my figment of imagination. And they kept it a secret, but we don't have time to talk about it. Whoever would like to get a few details later, I'll be here uh, at least for a while. <clears throat> a Polish honor guard. <clears throat> uh, uh, <clears throat> a BBC reporter <clears throat> and announcer, uh, Olenka Franco came from London. <clears throat> she interviewed me. <clears throat> uh, on the train coming and going for maybe 12, 14 hours, made a documentary, and this documentary went worldwide. I was invited to London with my son for the premiere. People were calling from all over the world, including India and Australia. Guess what question they had? As if they talked to one another. Why didn't we know about it sooner? This is 1998, and they didn't know there was a Katyn massacre, and I'm the son of an officer, and my family, and Polish people, and a nation. How were we supposed to feel? It's bad enough that the Soviets kept it a secret. They were the murderers. But we, the fighters for freedom, and I, I know this country, and I love this country, as I said before. I realize human make mistakes, they have reasons, so be it. That's not the biggest problem. The biggest problem is that we did not see it important enough to show in our history books, I don't know about last few years, but before, what happened. Katyn massacre was the largest international military crime of Europe or of all time. And we don't, some books I read, wouldn't even have a line on it. So, this is the question. Since that time, I have decided to dedicate my retirement to dissemination. Even though I was a, a technical person, chemistry, physics, math, uh, uh, American income taxes, tournament bridge, which I knew better than chemistry and physics, thanks heaven. All of a sudden, I decide to quit playing bridge who would want to quit in retirement what you know and love the best? Would you convince a golfer to do that? To, to do what?
to disseminate information and write and <laughs> speak in public places, I did it. Time is very good. Uh, I'll skip this one. The train was stopped uh, on the way back, and Polish Kuchma, president of Ukraine, uh, wanted to uh, serve bread, old Polish custom. I'll mention briefly. I come to my aunt in Chicago, uh, give her the sample of soil, and she cried. A 102-year-old woman cried. And so did I. Uh, the book was written, of course, by U of C in 2004. Now it's in uh, three languages. I was invited in April to Poland, <coughs> and an Im improbable happened. <coughs> in 26, in, in, 20, in 17 days, I was on 23 media interviews, TVs and radio, magazines, and seven live ones at Sturdy. I ask you, how is it possible? For some guy that was in Siberia and was a technical person, suddenly uh, it was an unprecedented event, so what I was talking about. Uh, recognition was not only there. Uh, on the left, I received a recognition from United States Congressman Rahm Emanuel. We all know who he was lately. And on the right, from the president of the Wazienki Royal Palace in Warsaw, for my activism on both sides of the ocean on that specific subject matter. I gave Teresa's book in here to show. <clears throat> Quickly, <clears throat> do you know why? She, I knew she was going to be here and talk about it, because I was asking a group <clears throat> to help out the translation into English and find a publisher, which I did. But what happened was another miracle from heaven. The publisher asked me to write the preface to the book. And can anyone guess what I wrote about? How the Polish communist government persecuted the families of the Katyn uh, uh, massacre. Can you imagine? That's the communist mentality. This is not to be forgotten. Not by me, not by my family, but none of the Polish people. What the communists governed. Of course they were under the thumb of Moscow, but to the extent they went is inexcusable. Uh, uh, this was in Krakow when I was there, and I'm almost finished real quick. Uh, at the culmination of my tour, I was invited to what many Polish people consider their holy place, Trzemsohova, to speak in a, a room adjoining the church. Uh, there was almost 500 people, and uh, uh, the subject matter I spoke was identity and remembrance. Uh, Sunday, uh, I was invited on top of the man monastery with a probably, I'm guessing, 15 stories high. If it's less, so be it. To speak to a crowd of 45,000 people below who came, this was a 70th anniversary, to pay tribute to the fallen in the people fallen in the Katyn massacre. How did it happen? A guy that was mixing chemicals for 40 years suddenly is in Poland speaking from a monastery, holy place to people below. I could not understand why all those things are happening to me. And this is Sunday, the last Time one. Up. Time up. This is the one what I was talking about. Closing statement. On the way out, I asked myself a question. All the things that happened, and you only heard the sum, were as against happening singularly, not to mention altogether. And I finally came to a conclusion and believe that in spite of all the ho uh, horrible things that happened to me, God, and my title of the book was when God looked the other way, God was always looking after me, holding me by my hand along the road that I chose for myself to search for truth and justice, and to speak for those who never had a chance to speak for themselves. Thank you.